you know you can get this part if you you can see when a young background actor is being hit on by a producer by a director by a crew member it happens all the time because for so long we've allowed that behavior to continue unabated on our sets now it became a shock for a lot of people that what constitutes harassment but sadly people are going to go unreported because at the end of the day it's all about feeding the belly on Ngululego on Culture. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Ngululego on Culture. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a big shout out to Khaukhelo Sebata, our videographer. Her handles are on the episode. Today we have a very, very, very special guest. Uh, Aosin Dati Mushesh uh, is someone that I would look at on television and be inspired by our work. And I'm very honored to have her next to us. Sister Tati, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, sometimes people uh, go through life without doing any work of any significance. Uh, I think your work on home affairs uh, had immense cultural impact. The stories being told of women uh, mm -hmm. in different facets of life. It was the first time I saw a white woman struggling. Uh, I didn't know that Africans white women struggle, mm. even though I'm sure conceptually that does exist. But I only yeah. saw it on television when I saw Home Affairs. What were the circumstances um, in your life before you got the phone call to go into Home Affairs? What were the circumstances? What uh, were you doing at the time? Sure, you're taking me back how many years now? <laughs> it's Around been, 15 years. It's, it's been a long time. So as artists, I suppose we're constantly waiting for that phone call from your agent saying, uh, I've received a brief. They're looking for somebody of this nature. And um, I actually, I'll be honest, I cannot recall what I was doing before that. But mm. I must have been busy because I was very busy before Home Affairs. Yeah. And you looked at the script and... What jumped out for you? Did you know that this was a story through the lens of women uh, from mm. different backgrounds? Did, what, was it that clear to you from the beginning? Yes, it was clear. It was made very clear by Roberta Durant, who is the producer of the show. And I think what caught my attention was it was about women. It was for women, by women. So my your DOP was a woman, your mm. producer is a woman, you've got uh, eight leads who are women so it was a very female orientated project even on set there was a lot of female energy and i don't believe that women can't work together in fact it was through home affairs i realized that when women work together it's actually a powerful force mm. it was an amazing energy on set because i think we come from the same place you don't have a man dictating how you should be feeling as a woman yeah. you've got a woman at the helm who understands exactly what another woman's going through, regardless of creed, race, or color. Yeah, and I said to you before we started recording that uh, the only other time I saw a corporate black woman being vulnerable was Garabo Morocco on Generations. I think she lost her eyesight with that character. With your character, you were a corporate black woman mm -hmm. and you had breast cancer as well. What was the significance of that kind of storyline for us to understand which black women can be more than just one thing? For me, it was also talking about my mom. It was talking about my aunts. I know Tandegas. I've met Tandegas. I've lived with the Tandegas of the world. And I like the fact that uh, for once, it was also about the vulnerability because there's a, there's a concept out there that black women must be strong. Yeah. I, I struggle with that word strong. What does strong mean? Does strong mean not being in touch with your feelings? Does strong mean putting up a front for the world to see that I can handle anything? Yeah. So... I loved the fact that she could be vulnerable and that she was also, she had a, a love interest because that's also another thing that's never really seen on mm. our screens. Well, back then is you see black women in a love story. We all, you know, we, we have sex too. <laughs> <laughs> it's just never shown on TV. And, and, and the fact that she was involved with uh, Senzo, his name was played by my dear friend, Hamilton Lamin in Dosh. Yes. And, um, and then he left her because of the breast cancer. Or rather, he didn't know how to handle it. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. So as a result of that storyline, I actually became involved with breast cancer. I started playing golf to raise funds for breast cancer survivors. Because what they found is that in the rural areas, a lot of women can't go for mammograms. 
So there was an organization that started raising funds to have mobile units go to the rural areas to have the ladies tested for a mammogram. So I became very, very actively involved with the subject, with breast cancer. Mm. Was there a, an immediate um, shift in how people saw you publicly as a result of that character in terms of your fame, in terms of maybe your recognizability as well. I mean, you mm, had been mm. um, a, a, a very good actor prior to that, but I think because it's on SABC One at 9 p.m., a lot yeah. of people would have seen it more. Oh, my life changed completely. Yeah. I, I suddenly became a celeb. <laughs> 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 I would never call myself a celeb um, yeah. on any good day, but I became a celeb. And I remember going to KZN for the first time on holiday and suddenly it was Tandek, 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 Tandek. Yeah. I had a little bit of fame on Onigoli, but I think, like you said, it, it became a numbers game because SABC One is the most watched yes. out of all the shows. Igoli was on Mnet. And, and, and Igoli was on Mnet. Yeah. So a lot of people didn't have access to Mnet. But now suddenly you're on SABC One 9 p.m., like you say, prime time, everybody's watching. And suddenly, I was recognized everywhere I went. Yeah, I understand, Uguti, there were Emmys as well. I just remember from memories that there were Emmy nominations. Yes. Um, um, it must be... Must Brenda. Have been, Brenda yeah, was nominated and, and Vatiswa. Yeah, yes. Those were incredible characters yes, as well. Yes, uh, So it, it shows, Uguti, that that was brilliant work. Were you guys all... Uh, invited to the Emmys or it was only those two nominate nominees? No, it's only, like in, in with any awards, it's sure. only the ones that are nominated mm. unless they're nominating the whole show. Then in that regard, um, producers and directors tend to go and the lead actress. So not everybody gets a chance to yeah. go, to, especially if it's international awards. Yeah. How was your... The agent would give you a call to say this is available. Mm. Uh, how was the availability of other jobs now as a result of you and Tandega? Uh, actually, mm, sure, this is a tricky industry, hey? Because sometimes, you know, um, okay, let me give you an example. After the long run, I kind of thought, yo, offers will be coming left, right, yes. and center. Not necessarily, because remember, it's also about commissioning of the work. Mm. So you find if the SABC is not commissioning work, MNET is not commissioning work, uh, SABC 2, ETV is not commissioning work. Actors sit for months on end waiting to work. So there was, there's always a gap in between one project and another. So it's not often that you find yourself working back to back. It, it has happened to me before, but it's not a, a usual thing that happens. Yeah, so you find you're really always waiting for the next project to happen. Because remember with dramas... Dramas are not telenovelas, they're not soaps. Mm -hmm. They only shoot for a year and then you either get recommissioned or not. So with a drama, it's six months at a time, three mm -hmm. months sometimes, six weeks sometimes. So it's six weeks of work and then you're sitting without work for until the next project. Yeah, um, we've had a couple like of people that are working in your industries come here and we have a good conversation and sometimes I want the conversation to be educational. Uh, Ufensa Mwase gave us an idea of how long it takes uh, to shoot something, to shoot how long it takes for 30 minutes worth of work on television. <laughs> uh, can you give us an, an insight in your world in terms of a, an episode, an hour's episode of Home Affairs or 45 minutes of Home Affairs? How long would that take really in real life? Was it days? Was it weeks to yeah. be able to shoot that? So Home Affairs was what, 13 episodes, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly? And it was an hour. Yeah, I think it was an hour yes. long show. So that I think that we shot over eight months. Um, so it means you pulling in fourteen hours on set. So sometimes I'd get work. I, I would get picked up at four o'clock in the fourteen hours. Fourteen hours. Yeah, we work long. We work really long hours. Sometimes even sixteen hours. Yeah. So we work very long hours so for, how that, would that, for that one like minute. From on, what time to what time would that work in a 14-hour day? So, so normally uh, I'd, I'd get picked up at about, say, 5 o'clock to be on in set. In the morning? Yes, to be on set at 6, and I'd only get home at 8 o'clock. So if that gives you an indication, because then you're waiting for other actors to also get picked up. So yeah. you'd find I'm, I live in Marlboro. Uh, and the next actor lives in Randburg, the next actor lives in Soweto, and they all have to be picked up to go to somewhere like Walkerville. Yeah. So it becomes a logistics, um, sometimes nightmare. <laughs> yeah. But and it becomes a, a logistics challenge to 
to pick up all those actors, to get them on set on time for them to wrap at a certain time to then get home and be ready for the next day. So you find your turnaround is not enough sometimes. So you get home and I must prepare scenes for the next day. Yeah, and this would be a continuous thing on Home Affairs, for example, for eight months. Yes, And yes. no break. I was about to ask, like no weekends nope. off or something like that? Only Sunday off. Wow. Yeah, only Sunday off. So you're also working six days a week. Wow. So when actors are complaining and they want the the working environment to be different it's because of exactly that it's because a um you put your life in danger by then driving yourself to set at four o'clock in the morning yeah. when you're exhausted from the night before um b also it's just a convenience of uh, g getting picked up and being safe it really is a safety element and because they keep such long hours and because then you're working six days a week we really need the conditions on our sets to really be different. So anyone who's working on a continuous soapy for 10 consecutive years really feels it for, for that long. <laughs> no, it's very different. It's completely different. So let me give you an example. So I was on Scandal for eight years. Yeah. So soapies are very different because you're working in a studio. Sure. Uh, on Home Affairs, we're working on location. So it meant we were out of studio oh yeah when you're working in studio sometimes i would walk in i'm not joking at eight o'clock in the morning and i'll be done by 10 in the morning oh okay nice yes one. That's so much so studio works completely different that's much so better. studio actors that's why in a way actors prefer but not in terms of anything else but just for the convenience is they prefer studio work because mm. studio works means you can still go and pay your bills on a drama, half the time you can't because you, re you, you lock down on that set from morning until night. Yeah. And in terms of, I mean, you've done amazing work throughout this career and we'll touch on a lot of the other things as Netflix and so, and so on and so forth. But perhaps in terms of the improvement of the industry that you're in, uh, you've had a stellar career. I'm sure you have observations of, of what needs to be improved uh, from the mental health of the workers, mm -hmm. the stability of the jobs that come in, mm -hmm. um, and maybe the unionizing as well. Maybe let's talk about that. some of the observations and things that you would have loved to see change over the next 20 years. Yes. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we actually do have a union. Okay. We do have SAGA, South African Actors Guild of Associ of um, Association. Sure. So, so we do have um, a, a guild like uh, the U.S. has SAG, like everywhere else in the world, there is an equity. The problem is a lot of us are not supporting the union. So if more actors signed up to SAGA and became a member of SAGA, mm -hmm. it meant then whatever SAGA is fighting for, for the actors, they're, they're fighting for the Bill of Protection Act. So if we had more voices, then some of these bills might get passed. But now they're very limited in terms of um, the voice that they have. So if more actors supported the guild, it meant it would mean more voices. It would mean then it, if it reaches uh, Natim Tetra's ears, it would be because it's almost like the whole industry is saying yeah. we need a change. I do need a um, pension fund. I do need a medical aid. I had to cancel my medical aid because I couldn't afford it. Last year, I had to cancel my medical aid. I was paying 2800 I won't wow. mention the medical aid, but yeah. I was forced to, and I'm saying forced to because I looked at my finances and I couldn't afford 2800 when half the time I'm not working. I'm waiting for a project to happen. Mm. Um, thank you to Netflix that I was able to then reinstate, not the same medical aid, I had to look for a more reasonable one because I realize at my age, I'm 53 in August, I cannot afford to not have medical yes, aid. Absolutely. But how many actors are sitting there without medical aid? 90% 90, 90 of them don't have medical aid. So that's why then they end up um, in, 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 in state hospitals. Yeah. Who would cover that though? Um, if you, because you're not permanently attached to any production house. You do work uh, temporarily and when it's done, it's done. So who would cover your medical and your uh, pension fund? So if the production companies then should do that. The same way uh, an accountant works for a firm and mm. the firm pays so much towards your medical aid and then you pay the rest. So it would be like a 50-50. 
So if I'm doing a telenovela for a year, it means the production company then should be covering me for that year. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether my contract gets renewed or not, it means at least for that year I'm covered, oh, yeah. which then poses the question to insurance companies that then shouldn't insurance companies also think of uh, tailor-making insurance uh, packages for artists because it's a different environment and yet we pay taxes. You see, if, I, if, I were, if I'm not working and I'm not paying my taxes, that's something else. But every time I'm working, I pay 25% tax. That's, mm. a, that's a lot to tax someone who might sit for the next eight months without work. Mm. So we also need to look at the tax um, package for, for artists because it should be on a afford, affording or affordability of your medical aid or pension fund or all these other perks that, that naturally any person who's employed in this country has access to. We yeah. don't. I have to then pay for my retirement annuity. I had a I had a meeting with my broker the other day and she and he said, "Oh, you are aware you're turning 55 in 2 years time. We have to relook at your retirement annuity." And that's the reality is that you you faced with something that if I was a teacher, if I was a nurse, I wouldn't even have to think about. My mother was a social worker. She worked for the government. Um when she passed on, she was with a medical aid that was subsidized by the state. Mm. My father could benefit from that. But now as an artist, my son can't benefit from my pension fund. Yeah. So, 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 so it's, it, it's, it's really not fair. And you find when you go to other countries um, uh, like Australia, it's so funny watching myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's um, bask in it. A so, so, bit. so when you go to like, no, I love it. I love it. Hi, yeah. hi, Tati. Um, so when you go to. Oh, by the way, sorry. Before you continue, yeah. uh, at the same time as we're having this conversation, Savage Beauty is playing. We'll talk about <laughs> Savage Beauty a little bit later on in yeah. the episode. So you find with in countries like Canada, your Australia's, your UK, artists are taken care of. There, there is a subsidy of some sort for actors. So mm. you never hear of an actor starving or an actor because they also have royalties. If I've done it, if, if every time home affairs is being shown, I'm getting royalties, it means I can survive. Yeah. So we also need to look at the royalties issue. Yeah, someone, that's something that uh, Matatsu Mufatsu was saying yeah. when he was here. Yeah. Uh, and he spoke about the fact that his work is shown in Argentina but is not compensated for it. Mm. Let's, let's break down the conversation of royalties. Um, if there are 20 to 40 cast members mm -hmm. um, and your work is shown in a different country, the production company or whoever owns that, that, that product mm. will get paid. How would you then as actors and actresses in that episode be, be paid from that? Um, so how royalties normally happen is that you're not going to get the full salary of your original contract. Sure. So they'd look at your contract, they'd look at the time slot. So if, say, for instance, Home Affairs is showing at prime time again, um, I could be wrong, but I'll be getting 25% of the original amount that okay. I've got. And it's not everybody that is uh, entitled to royalties. So you'd normally find it's, it's your leads that would um, qualify to be compensated for um, royalties. Yeah, so it's po it's potentially um, four or five people that would, would be would well. Be in in um, so with home affairs, it would be all eight leads. Would mm. we would all get twenty five percent of the original amount that we got? Yeah, saying what you're saying. I mean, every industry has issues, and I speak to people in music and football, and we talk about issues. So it's, this mm. is not about bashing your industry. Yeah, um, it's about educating people going into the industry what they need to know. Um, looking back in the last 25 years, what's different today about your industry? Um, because we know which women have always had a problem getting leads mm, uh, without mm. having to compromise themselves. Uh, how different is it today? Is it still a pandemic that women have to, have to pimp themselves before they get roles? Uh, is it still existing today? Has it ever existed really? Um... I suppose that will never change because remember you're also dealing with males. You're dealing with male producers and for as long as there are male producers, it's happening globally, mind you, mm -hmm. uh, the casting couch. Yes. I've been very fortunate that I've never been in a situation where I've been compromised in any way or somebody else would say, uh, you know, you can get this part if you give me A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not happening because we... We sometimes see it 
even on our sets. You can see when a young background actor is being hit on by a producer, by a director, by a crew member. It happens all the time. It, it, it makes my blood boil. And I always say to them, do you know that poor child is not here for you to hit on her? Mm. That child is here to make money so she can feed a family. So women are still victimized. That's why uh, Swift was created. And Swift uh, has looked into those abuses that, that still continue to this day to happen. I think on certain sets, um, you have what they're called intimacy coordinators. We did that on Isona, where before we started filming, we had a workshop about what constitutes harassment, mm. what constitutes intimacy between actors. So if I've got a kissing scene, uh, the intimacy co coordinator will be there on set to in ensure that no appropriate behavior happens between the two characters. Mm. So we need more intimacy workshops. In fact, I feel like before the beginning of every year, before the beginning of any production, an intimacy coordinator needs to be there to just remind us of what constitutes um, harassment or not. So if I walk in in the morning and someone says, uh, hey, Asinta, do you want today? Oh, Asinta, you looking pretty today. Um, depending on the tone, yeah, that can constitute harassment, and a lot of people don't realize that because I'm not your intimate partner. Yeah, um, and maybe not maybe your, your, your maybe your 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 comment is not welcome. Mm. In fact, I, I don't like your remark. And then uh, you hear some of them say, "Hey, opakile." <laughs> That's Immediately, that's harassment. That's inappropriate. No, that's completely inappropriate. But you see, because for so long, we've allowed that behavior to continue unabated on our sets. Now, it became a shock for a lot of people that what constitutes harassment. So actors or actresses should feel emboldened enough to then go to a coordinator and report if they've made to feel uncomfortable. But sadly... People are going to go unreported because at the end of the day, it's all about feeding the belly. Yeah. So people will never report because they're scared of being victimized or um, maybe not working ever again. And for as long as that's always hanging over our heads, people are, a lot of these incidences are going to go unreported. Yeah, I mean, there's been a, a very strong discussion. Uh, it's, it's interlinked with the Dubai discussion. Um, mm. Oguti, why are young black women pimping themselves going to yeah, Dubai? Yeah, in fact, I was listening to Jackie Pumutze's Yes, in, yes, yeah. that conversation. And yeah. and I think, like you're saying, for, as long, as, for yeah. as long as the incentive is for someone to be a successful actor or actress, they will always put themselves in a position where they can't stand up to that. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Is, it, is, is it an industry that you would gladly allow your kids to be in with that being said? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, my, my son is a keen photographer mm. and he's been taking photographs since he was, what, eight years old. And I suppose because I'm in the industry, I would guide him. I would. Um, but these kids also know a lot. Eh? They, it's not like we, they, they're living in, in a bubble. They're also very aware of the dangers that are out there. Because remember, there's all these cases that are happening in the U.S. that are happening everywhere else in the world as well. Mm as well as this country. So would I encourage, who am I to be a dream crusher? If my niece wants to be an actress, I'm there to guide them. For, I think for as long as you know that you, you have people on your side or people you can talk to, I think it's always about who your support structure is in this industry. Yeah. I would provide that support structure for a loved one. I would go back to the original question. In your analysis, is this worse or better in the last 20 years? The harassment of women on set, the, the putting in obstacles for them in order for them to be great actresses, to get these great roles, this is what they need to go through. Because in where I come from in sports, in my industry, there is a domination of women and mm. there's an implied um, or an assumed uh, thought that if you are a woman standing in front of us presenting sports, yeah. that that's what you needed to do. And in most cases, it's true, but it's also tragic that some women deserve to be there because mm. of their talent as well. So is it worse or getting better or is it still the same? Well, thanks to social media, it's been height, uh, highlighted, if I can put it like that. It's always been there. It's always been there. 
I remember um, in my instance, there was there was a, a certain gentleman who was a pest, who was a sex pest, for lack of a better word. May his soul rest in peace. Um, but someone like Togon Jinga then saw the harassing. So he was hitting on me mm. and I was walking up a flight of stairs and he, he was hitting on me. And then Sister Togon Jinga saw this and immediately called him to order. So for as long as there are Togon Jingas as well, um, for as long as if you see it, you call that person on it. So it's also about someone witnessing harassment happening in front of you and not doing anything about it. Mm. Because I also believe that would pull a stop to it. So Togon Jinga then confronted that, that said gentleman, um, whom she also knew that was a sex pest. And she said, don't you dare. She's a child. Okay, did his behavior change? No, not necessarily. But in that instance, he knew that on that particular set, there is a Togon Jinga who's looking out for young girls. Yeah. So for as long as we have the Togon Jingas on every set, we might minimize the amount of harassment that happens on our sets. How important would um, an influx of women directors, women uh, owners of production houses, would it be in terms of changing the behavior? Because as you said, because it's such a male-dominated space as it relates to who gives jobs to whom, maybe if there were more women who, who own these production houses, mm. 50 to 70%, if, if they were there, because I think 80% of most of the production houses, the directors, the producers are male. Anyways. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, how important would that be if there were more women? Let me give you an example with Home Affairs. On Home Affairs, because it was so female sure. dominated, there was no harassment at all. If there was, um, that person would have been called on it immediately because, my goodness, all eight of us were very strong-willed. Yeah. So it also, become, it also becomes about the character of the woman being harassed. So are you the type to then be a victim or are you the type to then say, I will not be victim to this and I will do, some, do something about it. So I'm encouraging young actresses on sets, always have someone that you can report to. You're not on your own. There are coordinators, there are organizations in place to protect you. Yeah. A, a, an organization like SWIFT in our, in our industry where you can, and it doesn't, it can be anonymous um, it can be, so even with me, um, witnessing harassment, I don't necessarily have to, I can even write a letter and say, I witnessed this and this happening. So if people are scared to come up because they might be victimized, there are ways and means mm -hmm. to report. Yeah, by the way, Togon Jinga was on Velapina famously. Yes, Yeah, yes. whatever, all the young kids. Yeah, uh, Togon Jinga yeah. said she's no. referring to... I can't she, remember she's what still her, my She's still my, my hero to this day. Do you remember day. what her role was? Uh, what's her name? Oh, sis, uh, what was her name? Uh, sis, uh, oh, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I forgot. Yes, but she was on yeah, Velapina yeah. um, with... Uh, so with, I'd, I'd like to personally thank her for that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, and that wasn't, the only, that wasn't the only instance. She, there were two or three instances where she did come to my rescue. So I I am now a Togon Jinga to a younger actress on set. A nice one. Um, when Patrick Shai passed away, oh. you posted about it. Yeah. What was your relationship with him? So darling Patrick Shai. Um, but Brad Pitt, uh, I, I actually played his lawyer. Um, in a in 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 a series about GBV. Isn't that interesting? Mm. So Patrick's character was actually abusing his wife mm. on Soul City, and I defended his character. And, you know, he's come out openly oh, yes. about it. Openly yes, about, yes. Uh, but, but I think it was also uh, through a series like Soul City where, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of talk and awareness about GBV. So GBV has been there f from... Time memorial, mm -hmm. really. But now, more than ever, it's just people are, are talking about it. So Brapet and I then developed a relationship from Soul City. Sadly, I never worked with him again, but I would meet him at theaters all the time. Mm -hmm. At some stage, we had a theater group where we used to hang out a lot. So, And his professionalism stood out for me, and his commitment to this role stood out for me because what, what, what he brought to the character is... Sometimes the man who's doing the abusing 
has got issues that they also need to deal with. So do hurt people hurt others? I'm not quite of that. It's not that people hurt people hurt others. It's circumstances surrounding the person then becoming an abuser we need to look at. Right now, South Africans are depressed. Mm. People are losing jobs all the time. So violence, uh, domestic violence is on the rise now more than ever because I think men are not dealing with the, the, the emasculation of who they are. The fact that now you, from somebody who was a provider in the family, mm. suddenly you don't have a job. Maybe your wife looks at you differently. Your kids don't look at you the same. And because we are such a violent country, let's not pussyfoot around it. Mm. South Africans are violent. Mm. Even just thinking about even growing up, um, there was a lot of violence mm. happening in the townships all the time. So we're very violent. But we need to then look at what sparks the violence. What is it that makes a man feel like he can just um, brutalize the woman that he professes to love? And it's always been there. Mm. It's just now we've just creating an awareness about GBV. But GBV is always, always been there. We just remember, it's just that back in the days, in the township, if a, if a man was beating up his woman, the other men would gang up and they would beat him up. Mm. It's not happening anymore because we 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 don't get involved in each other's lives mm. anymore. And there are yeah. guns as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are guns yeah. and there are consequences. Yeah. You know. But then it it was stabbing. So uh, my father was a surgeon. So I cannot tell you the amount of times we, we would in the middle of the night get a knock on the door and it's someone who is is bleeding because uh, the boyfriend, husband, partner stabbed her for whatever reason or other. So GBV has always, always been there in yeah. our communities. Let's take it back to Undate Patrick Shai, because I think the, the circumstances surrounding uh, his death were tragic, um, to say the least, because... Um, but we don't really know what still happened. I'm, yeah, that's I, the thing. I'm, like, I, I, I'm, very, I'm very cautious about okay. um, commenting on something that um, can, in a, in a way, can only be verified by Brad Patrick. Sure. Do, do you know what I mean? So it's... We don't know what led to the circumstances because we don't even know if he was depressed all this time. Oh, because yeah. knowing the Patrick that I know, um, Patrick was a happy person. But yes, of course, you don't know if somebody mm. is masking something else, maybe a sadness that mm. is... What happened publicly, sorry to cut you, what happened publicly was that there was a Casper Nyovest fight. And yes, no, I remember that. And I remember then that he incident. shot a video swearing yes. at Casper Nyovest. Yes. Um, and a lot of people are saying that was jokingly. And then there was a pile on, on social media that he, uh, the fans came back and they started swearing at him. Yeah. Um, they started harassing him. And then he shot a video apologizing for that. And then a week or so, around 10 days later, yeah. um, he passed away. So um, it, it was a tragic circumstance. You cannot help but connect those sequence of events. So that's what happened that led to that. But I respect what but, you're but, saying. But, but is, it, is, is that like, not the danger of social media? Yeah. Because then what's happening is people are specu speculating. Yeah. So um, with every death, people always want um, an explanation. It could be a car accident. People will still want to know what happened. So as long as there's a death, someone wants someone to blame yeah. for whatever happened. So we all, we've all become the jury, we've all become judges, but only the person involved knows exactly what triggered. Mm. So it could have been a trigger, who knows? So that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm very careful about, sure. about um, speculating on what could have led to bra -pratic. Um Mind you, even that, <laughs> it depends who's telling, who's telling us what happened. Mm. So one thing my father taught me and from a young age is he said, you must always question everything. Yeah. So I do. <laughs> I, yeah. if, so, if you send me a, a book, um, I will verify, I will investigate, I will research before I then get to a truth. So he taught me the art of questioning everything you read. He says, you must always question who is telling the story what is the motive of the person telling the story so it's a what it's a why it's a how so it's exactly that who was telling the story who broke the news what is the motive if mm. there's a motive what is agenda if there's an agenda at the end of the day 
somebody lost their lives. Mm. And for me, that is what matters. Is uh, Patrick, uh, Brad Patrick left a wife, left kids, left colleagues, left fans who were heartbroken by his death. Yeah. We can't play judges. For sure. No, um, we can't play judges. What's your relationship with social media? How do you navigate Yo. around comments, <laughs> around negativity? Do you handle your own social media? I don't have a Twitter account. I don't have a thick skin. Mm. I'll be honest. I really don't have a thick skin. I take things very, very personally. I'm, I'm highly, highly sensitive. So I'm not on Twitter. Um, I think you are on Instagram. Instagram I am and on, on Facebook. But in a way, those, um, how can I put it? Um, in order to survive in this industry, you do need to some form of, um, what's the word? Visibility yeah. on social, social media. media. So I am visible. I don't engage as much as I should. Uh, but Netflix, in a way, uh, Savage Beauty has taught me the art of engaging. You do need to engage with the people that support you. Mm. So that I do. I've become... I, I, I do engage a lot more yeah. now than, than I've ever done before. Perfect time to segue to Savage Beauty. Yeah. Is <laughs> Savage Beauty. From what I'm reading and what I, what I saw briefly, <laughs> was this <laughs> 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 You are a scary <laughs> woman who has the potential to kill people. Just talk us through oh, Savage Beauty. What's the story there? Um, and maybe about Netflix as well. Uh, Uguti, how different was the setting and the scene uh, yeah. and the treatment from Netflix from uh, your other works on SABC and others? Uh, let me start with uh, Netflix. Was this I saw you. You kill people So, so the one thing about Netflix is that there are there are strict protocols set yeah. in place, which is great. So, for instance, uh, actors should not work more than so many hours. You you can't shoot more than so many scenes a day, which mm -hmm. then protects the actor. It makes sure that it ensures then that I'm not exhausted yeah. all the time. Um. And having said that, um, yeah, Savage Beauty. <laughs> yeah, Grace Bengu. What a character. I remember I remember getting the brief and going to audition for Grace Bengu. So my challenge then became Grace Bengu was a Morongwe, was a Tandega, was a all the roles that I've played before. Sure. And the challenge became how do I make this one different? I like to think I did make a difference um, with the material that I was given. But I'll be honest, it, it rang, uh, there were alarm bells that went on because a lot of the, uh, the things that, uh, that, that inform her decisions are very similar to all the other characters I've played before. Mm. And the fact that I've worked with Dumsani before, Dumsani and I had just worked together before, yeah. and he does play my love I think interest you are, or, or Isona on Isona, and he played my love interest. So... You can imagine I go to audition and there's Dumsani playing my husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was a, an advantage because then we because we had worked together, so the synergy became a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But now the roles were reversed. Where on Isono, um, he was the one doing the chasing. Mm -hmm. On this one, I was the one who was in a loveless marriage, wanting this man to desperately love me. Yeah, and, and there was great comments from your uh, co-cast members. Uh, as you were premiering with Savage Beauty about your works. And I, I've seen some reviews as well about your works there. Um, in terms of interpreting that character, you mentioned Utanega and feeding yeah. off from your previous characters. Actually, sorry, no, not Tanega so much. Mamo Hato on Saints and Sinners. Sure. Um, Was there any special Mary preparation? On, Mary on, on Isona. It, it's, it's, it's always the, the, what's the word? Almost the evil witch of the story i'm always the evil witch of the story so it's it's how how evil can i be with this one how, what what kind of evil angle can i bring to this one which is very challenging yeah in fact i've just turned down um a, a, a great project but i'll be honest i i got the brief and it just sounded like i'm gonna be a grace and a mary again and i just said no um, could I afford to turn down the work? Not really. But mm. uh, I think as a performer, I have been so stereotyped. And I think I mm. need to also get away from that if I can. Th these roles seem to follow me. I don't know if I follow them or they follow me. But, yeah. but, I, but I just sadly had to turn down a brilliant piece of work. Yeah. But um, I think there's, an, there's a 
there's another actress who could maybe give it a different angle to what I've done because I'm I'm not sure that I have it in me to do something different with these kind of roles again. Yeah, we'll touch on typecasting a little bit later yeah. on because uh, that's called typecasting where you're literally mm. just being given one type of roles. Uh, but with this uh, Savage Beauty, um, how is, I think maybe you might be reaching into a younger audience. What is the on the ground reception? Have you met people um, oh, yeah. compliment or My family. Uh, against what you're saying, mm. what, what, what you are acting there or portraying there? There, there's certain actors. I got a call from Lissetti Job. Lissetti Job is one of my very, very good friends in the industry. She's a theater director. She's an actor herself. And she just gave me um, a great review and a constructive criticism on my performance on Savage Beauty. So I also have people that I can rely on. Uh, Leradon Velas is another one. Yeah. Harriet Maneman is another one. She's my best friend. But also, she's my acting benchmark. So these are the people that I would, okay, I take their notes. Okay, my friend, yeah, with this one, this and this and that. So in a way, I feel like, um, okay, so before I turned down this new job, maybe I should have gotten an acting coach. I believe in acting coaches because actors internationally always work with acting coaches because yes. what an acting coach would do is then they would look at maybe the last two works that I've done mm. and then they would have said no take the job just do it differently and this is how you do it differently but now the problem with working with acting coaches is that once you get on set it's also the director's view <laughs> yeah you see yeah. internationally especially in the US acting coaches are a strong force so the acting coach would then work directly with the actor and they would say, this is what I would require from your actor for this particular role. But sadly in this country, that wouldn't work. So yes, I could work with an acting coach, but that's my interpretation with the acting coach. And then I get on set and the director might have a different, and then they would set me back to what I've done before. Oh yeah, because that's what they were looking for initially. Because that's what they were looking for initially. And mm. then maybe that's why they were, because I didn't audition for this one. It was offered to me. Mm. No, I did audition. I, put a, I did a self-tape. But yeah. it, 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 it sounded like more, uh, okay, it was a formality. The yeah. role, the role it's, is yours. It's Israel Zulu was always a thug uh, in many of his characters. Mm. Um, you know, and he's spoken about this, that, you know, you are typecast. You know, yeah. you become that one character. And I think towards the end of her life, Uma Meritwala as well, uh, became the typical Magogo in every series. Uh, so Ms. Mklongo's mother. Uh, well, that she couldn't really escape because yeah, then because it becomes a... Um, uh, because acting is also... Because it's a visual medium, so it mm. becomes about the physicality. So I can probably get away with playing the mother up to a certain age and then Mum Mary Charlie was always going to get the gogo. Yeah. Because of her physicality, because of her age and yeah. because of That's the experience point. that she has. What so else would you like to do now? Explore? In comedy. Mm -hmm. Oh, comedy. <laughs> because um, contrary to popular belief, I'm very funny. <laughs> I'm extremely funny. I make, I make the people around me laugh a lot. Yeah. So there is a... I did, I did comedy when I was studying. And I've done one or two comedy series. Yeah. So I would love to tackle the funny side of me because my, my dad was funny. My brother was funny. Mm -hmm. I come from a very funny family. So I wouldn't mind tackling a, a comedic role. Yeah. I'd love that. Can you talk about your family without delving too much into the upbringing, but perhaps the impact of your father? I mean, that's been throughout this conversation. And yeah. I, it's so for me, it's so heartwarming because I come from a township where... I think 80% of, um, from Cape Town, 80% yeah. of the townships there yeah. are fatherless homes. Mm. And a lot of what I learned as a man is male energy from hip hop. Fortunately, yeah. I loved books too. Yes. So, so you, I, yeah. I got that yeah. from books yeah. as well. But no one taught me how to be a man and be a father. And I'm mm. navigating that. Um, you know. So just talk about your family life and what you learned from your mother and father. From my mother, I learned compassion. I learned so Oma 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 Mawasiko. Mamako. Yes. Oh nice. So one. my second name is Yolis. Oh yeah. Oma yeah, Yol. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so from my, from my mom I learned Sorry. compassion and kindness and the fact that um you need to just be present in your own life and to never lose your sense of curiosity, lose your sense of awe. Um my mom was like a little girl. I mean, up until 
her last breath, I would say. She was still, that, there was a little girl in her just wanting to explore things and, and, and see things. And, and, oh, yeah, no, she, she was an amazing personality. Mm. My father, on the other hand, extremely strict. He was your... You're saying she was, he was a surgeon? Yeah, he was a surgeon. Wow. Yeah, big deal, huh? Yeah, for, no, for, no, for us no, in the really, township, it's a no, big deal. No, it really deal. was a big deal. Yeah. Um, I, I, did a, I did a documentary, Who Do You Think You Are?, uh, about my lineage and my heritage. Sure. And when I was in Lesotho, one of the things that I found was my dad's original letter that he wrote on um, the overheads, Zase Vets, mm. in 1955 when he was a second year student. And my brother framed that. So that is one of my most prized possession mm. is to see my dad's original handwriting mm. writing on behalf of his father. He wrote this letter to Vitz on behalf of his father because my grandfather could not uh, afford to go to the centenary of Vitz. So yes, no, it's a, it's a big deal. So education was huge on, uh, was something that my father prized more than anything else. It was, no one can take your education away. Mm. So as a result, I read every single day. If there's something that you raise here that I don't know about, trust me, when I get home, I'm going to Google and research it. Mm. So we grew up, with, we had a library at home where we could read and read for hours and hours and hours on end. I still buy hard copy newspaper. Um, you'll never see me reading on, on an iPad or anything. I still want to physically feel a book. Please, can I feel sure. that? So there's something about holding a book like this and reading it and, and referring back to it and, 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 and taking notes and putting on the side and yes. highlighting. That's me. All my books are highlighted and, and I remember something and I put it on the side. I write notes on the books. Yeah. All right. So By the way, this is, I'm so sorry. this is uh, Dan Moyana's book. Dan Moyana is a presenter on ENCA. This mm. talks about his heritage as well, uh, where he comes from. I think part of his family comes from Mo Mozambique, and yeah. that's like within the first 10, 20 pages. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested, you get it on exclusive books or CNA. It's mm. a very nice read as well. Um, and then you are being impacted by your father and your mother. Mm. And how does Usus Ntati become then as a parent? You have more compassion towards your kids. You were saying something yeah. very profound to me that you didn't really notice, is that you don't force your kids to be in no. any industry. No. And I thought that was very impressive. <laughs> because a lot of parents would want their children to be whatever. They live vicariously through their children. Well, my parents allowed me to be an actress. Mm. And that wasn't easy. For my, certainly for my father, it wasn't easy because uh, he got a lot of flack in a way because a lot of their uncles and aunts were saying, you, you just send your child to a private school and then they want to do drama. Why? You know, why can't they be a doctor, a lawyer? Or, yeah. So um, parental support is everything because it can't be then I'm living my dream through my child. Yeah. My child must tell me what you'd like to do and I can only guide love and support but I can't influence his decision mm. because then his world the world is very different when I was in metric and when my son was in metric it's a completely different world Absolutely. they were talking robotics Absolutely. they're talking web design they're talking other careers in fact they reckon in the next, not even that long ago, in the next 10 years, there's certain professions that will be completely obsolete. Absolutely. Yeah. So now we need to start looking at other avenues of, I mean, this, this is a career now. Yeah. Podcasting. So podcasting, podcasting is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a great career. Yes. So we've gone away from your traditional. We go, we're mm -hmm. now looking at different avenues. And who knows what the, the future, I mean, I was looking at a Tesla the other day. Uh, the fact that this car can actually basically drive itself. Yeah. Yes, it'll take us another 50 years before South Africa is Adopt on that level. It. But the fact is, it's happening. Um, so it means being open. So I'm, I'm very open because my father allowed me to be what I wanted to be. My mother allowed me to be what I, I want to be. So I cannot then, you know, turn a blind eye to my son's dream. He can be whatever he wants. At the same time, having said that, if he decides to change his mind, that's also allowed. Mm. I think that's another thing is that people think you must be locked into just that one thing. But now if my son is traveling and he's seeing the world through different eyes, he's getting influenced by different things. Today he likes this button. Tomorrow he likes that button. Is anything wrong with that? Because it means then his world is expanding. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he can't waste money. And, and be changing from course to course. So 
I will teach him, if you start with this red button, you're going to see to its end. If after the four years, after you've got the certificate or diploma, you decide now you want to do that, mm -hmm. be willing to, to commit to that. So it's all about commitment. So if there's one thing I can teach him, be commit to whatever you choose. Yeah. Um, I think my daughter will grow up. She's 10. She will grow up to have compassion towards men because I'm present. Mm. Uh, mm. Do you have compassion towards men now because i remember when you were talking about gender-based violence and i could pick that up that at the very least you you have some compassion towards men would you you understand the animals that they are yeah, because yeah. your father was present because your father was there you understand that they have a capacity to love you understand it's, that they yeah. have a capacity to hate as well yeah i think there's a demonization blanket demonization of black men in south africa do you do you have more compassion than the average woman for men because of your father brothers <laughs> yeah also my brothers i've got amazing brothers so there are five of us and i'm right in between i'm, I'm the middle child so i've got a brother an older brother who's sadly passed on mm -hmm. and a younger brother so because i grew up with boys um you you understand their wiring that boys are wired very differently yeah. from women and then i had my son and then um you know i, I used to tell him that Sabelo, can you just be a human being and not a boy? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean by that? And I yeah. said, no, just some things you do. And, and, and because you're wired, you're a boy, you're wired very differently. Some of the choices that you make are very boy driven. But now, of course, gender is very fluid now. Now you've got he, her, you know, you've got nine binary, you've got binary. And even yeah. that, I'm trying to, to navigate that and, and find out a lot more about that and be sympathetic. Because, you know, then you remember, even growing up in the township, I remember there's a boy, um, I won't mention his name because he could still be alive, but growing up in Gatlon, there, there was a boy who was gay. And, and I remember he, 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 he was so comfortable playing with the girls than he was playing with the boys. But now... Sadly, wherever he is, did he come out of the closet? Mm. Because now our communities and our society doesn't allow people to... Okay, now it does. But then it must have been very difficult for him to navigate his life in a, in, a, in a very toxic masculinity uh, environment. And how many uh, men out there were never able to come out of the closet and live their truth? Because we would not allow them to become who they are mm. yeah it's a tricky one it's yeah. it's, it's it's this yo this life is <laughs> it's weird yeah I, I, I get it like you there's a point from cape town townships where you could not have existed as a gay man it, no. it would have been incredibly difficult now they'll probably kill you yeah yeah, yeah absolutely i mean we kill each other r routinely uh every 12 months in south africa black men kill other black men 18,000 times yeah. um, every 12 months. The, the, the numbers are scary. Yeah. But it's a fear of the unknown. So that which you don't understand, you either try and understand it or you reject it. Mm -hmm. So now, if somebody sees a behavior that they're not familiar with or that seems odd to them, instead of trying to understand it by rejecting it, then some, some of them resort to violence. So it's all about fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. But how about, how about opening up your scope and just say, instead of demonizing somebody, instead of rejecting somebody, how about I try and put myself in their shoes mm. and try and understand where they're coming from? So are people born gay or do they become gay? At some stage, I used to say being gay is fashionable. It's never been about fashion. It's always been about people living their truth. Yeah, you wouldn't live. You wouldn't put your life in at risk. No. Uh, for the sake of being fashionable. No. Because it, it, you it's would... about it's about the truth, and and this is the one industry that does allow people to be themselves. Mm. Um, if you look at a lot of shows now, it's very unlikely that you will have a show that does not have. A gay story. We have one on Savage Beauty. Yeah, yeah. That's and the incredible. way it's handled, it's it's two women who are in love with each other. Mm. At the end of the day, it's all about love. It's who I choose to love. It's a love thing. Yeah, I think it was a shock culturally when Senzo and Jason on Generations uh, were a couple, 
And it why was, should it be a shock? It was. It was, I remember yeah, yeah. at the time, 10, 12 years ago, that yeah. it was a culture shock because for the first time on prime time at 8 p.m., you see two men kissing. And yet and, it's been happening. Yeah. It's just that it happened on a visual medium. That's yeah. the only difference. It just happened to be on a visual medium. But it's been going on. It's been happening. We all have uncles who are gay. We all have family members who are gay. We saw them. We didn't talk about it. We spoke in hush-hush tones. It's only because for the first time now you see it. And I, I bet you 99% of us said, yes, but I, I know the story because that's my uncle. I know mm. the story because that's my aunt. Yeah. Um, as we're wrapping up the conversation, uh, I saw that you are related with Monero. Yes, she's my niece. <laughs> and I love her music. Oh, she's got an amazing voice. Oh. I love her music. What oh, is she doing good. now? Though? Like, is she still um, releasing music? Yes, she is. She oh, is. by the way, Monewa, if you're watching this, please come to the Yellow Couch. Please. Yes, yes. That's an invite. I would love to um, have you. Auntie is going to call you after this and you're going to definitely come. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so much. No, she, she's still working on her music, mm. but she... I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but she she's writing something. Okay. Yeah. In fact, we have a meeting very soon, the two of us. And she said, hey, auntie, please can you look at what I've written? And then what I've done is I'm going to then hook her up with a script writer. And mm -hmm. then they can guide her in being a script writer. So she, she's highly, highly talented. The fact that she wants to write. I mean, she writes her own lyrics. Sure. She might as well write a script. <laughs> and she's your niece because Ma she's uh, your her, his, her, her mom... And, and I are first cousins. So my dad and her grandmother mm -hmm. are first cousins as well. Mm -hmm. So she, she really, she is my niece in the true sense of the word. All right. Lastly, Stella Ukteta and Malik on Netflix. Nenze Malik on Netflix. Can we talk about <laughs> Netflix <laughs> money? <laughs> I mean, Netflix. Pay, no, it pays decent. Yeah, it I was really about to say, Netflix decent. gets some great yeah. reviews from everyone yeah. I've spoken no, to. No, it, it pays so decently. I mean, I can honestly relax a little bit. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, anxious to find the next job after... Netflix I mean, you've pay. spoken about yeah. turning down some jobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Netflix paid decently. <laughs> and they pay in dollars. Do, do you guys pay people in dollars? No, I wish it was in dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's very decent. Yeah. It's really it's decent. So it, I, w I would love to do more Netflix stuff. Oh, yes, I was about to say that. Yeah. Does it make it easier for you to look at them and say, long term, I would mm. rather do Netflix than television? No, I'll always do South African stuff as well. Mm. You know, it's all about balancing. It's all about uh, you You take some, you you let down others. But but no, I will never not, I will never stop doing South African work. I'll do, mm. yeah. Because, I, because at the same time, um, yes, as much as the money is not great, but this is, where, this is my space. So I need to also grow within this space. Yes, absolutely. And contribute and to this space. And you need to space. be seen by people yes, who cannot afford. Yes, because now, um, if I'm not being seen locally, you know, it does, it does it matter then being seen internationally? Mm. So home is still best. Do you have a movie in you at some point? Like, have you written something that you like, uh, one day this will be released and this will be a blockbuster? I'm an ideas person. I, I come up with 15 ideas in a day. I take after my father like that. My mm. dad used to come up with crazy ideas, but amazing ideas. So I've learned to uh, write down my ideas. He used sure. to say that. He says, always carry a book uh, oh, yes. with you. Yes. And then he used to say, if you have to sleep with like a notebook next to you. So as a thought comes to you at four o'clock in the morning, quickly write it down yes. before you forget it. So I've started um, doing that. Yes, there is something that I'm working on with uh, my friend Harriet Manamel. All right. What are you listening to as a parting shot to your fans so that they know what do you listen to? What do I listen to? Um, I love In terms of music. I love Tepo Oh. I love ah, Tepo Tool. He's I godly. I love, I love um, Gege. Yes. Um, he's a gospel musician. Yeah. I love Zoe Mudicha. My goodness. Ah. I, I have fallen in love with Zoe Mudicha because yes. she performed um, on a show. And I just remember just hearing this voice and thinking, Oh, who is that voice? I am in love with Zonke. Um, Lulu Digana was one of my favorite, favorite. Sure, so if, which is if, Zonke's sister. Yeah, so if you could play that song, Life and Death, by yeah. Lulu Digana, you would have made my day. I yes, absolutely love Lulu Digana.
It, it, Life and Death is a beautiful song. I love Life and Death. It, it, it's it's on my um, repeat. It's a pity that we only knew her from that song after she had passed on. Like we started. Have, have you listened to her album though? Have you listened no, to I, I. It was on heavy rotation on Metro and, Ra- oh, and Radio Two Thousand. Please that do song. yourself a favor and listen to her, her album. Um, uh, speaking about the ones who have passed on. Um, um TK Minga. Oh, oh yes, Sakani Minga was a beautiful. Her, her rendition of Summertime, it, it's still possibly one of the best I've ever heard. Yeah. Black Butterfly. So I, I think I think I love I love Afropop. Oh, you're a music person. Yeah. I mean, I love, as you, as, and as and, you and in a way then having Munewa then sing Afropop, then it becomes okay, this makes sense. Let Dambulu still remains to this day one of my favorites. Yeah, I just want to play a few seconds of Life and Death oh. so that people can hear what you're saying. Oh. Listen to that. Oh. Mm. Oh, I'm going to get emotional now. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised that oh. you love music. Listen. Oh, the, oh. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It's actually it's actually given me an idea. Maybe maybe to honor to honor Lulu, I must speak to Zonka and maybe and, and having that as a theme song is do something about life and death. Because the the if you listen to the lyrics, it also talks about sacrifice. What kind of man? Yes. Yeah. It's all about What kind of love is this? Yeah. So so it's talking about sacrifices. For me then it's the sacrifices my parents made to send me to a private school back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So it's all about the, the, the love that a parent has, a, a partner has. So if Zonk is listening, yeah, maybe there's a project, Life and Death, and we that's a theme song. All right. Awesome, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I really this enjoyed incredible. this. incredible. really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys, uh, for <laughs> joining us as well on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching us. <laughs>